let's uh, take our seats and get this meeting underway. All right, uh, thank you everybody for uh, getting here on time and let's get this meeting going. Uh, the uh, Port Order Use Authority Board of Directors meeting for Friday, April 13th, 2018. Uh, Pledge of Allegiance, uh, if Mr. Lewis would join, uh, leave for us. Agenda on to acknowledgments. Um, Mr. Hulamart. Yes, Chair. Uh, I just have a couple of announcements. Uh, one, the uh, Monterey Peninsula Job and Career Fair is going to be on April 18th at 10 a.m. at Monterey Peninsula Student Center. And I doc saw Dr. Crively at lunch today and he wanted to make sure that folks are aware of that. Um, another item of importance to the region is the infrastructure summit that's going to be conducted on April 30th at 7.30 a.m. starting at the Embassy Suites in Seaside. Another important item is on May 3rd at 9.30 a.m. up in Watsonville at the Mellow Center. The Monterey Bay Economic Partnership will be doing the annual regional economic summit. Of particular importance in a few weeks, our colleagues in the United States Army are going to be conducting uh, a series of wonderful informative things about the impact area by doing guided nature walks and if you haven't done these guided nature walks in the past you're missing a real experience understanding the Fort Ord history and the Army's history in this area and what the impact area is about it's going to be on May 5th at 9 a.m. there are two different walks for those of you who are less light of foot It'll be a one mile walk and for those of you who are more interested in extending that walk it's a three mile walk. Is that right Bill? That's right Michael. Um, there's also reservations required. So okay. if you check the forward.com website you can make reservations. That's critically important because you're limited to a hundred participants and you've sold out in the past. So uh, for those of you interested now's the time to take uh, advantage of that. Do they have a golf course option? A golf course. <laughs> So, Chair, that's all I have in terms of uh, additional items today. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move into uh, closed session. If Authority Council will read us into closed session, please. Yes, thank you, Chair, uh, members of the board and public. Uh, closed session today, uh, item 4A, conference with legal counsel, government code section 54956.9A, Marina Community Partners, LLC versus Fort Ord Reuse Authority, <clears throat> Monterey County Superior Court case number 18 CV 871. 4B, Conference with Legal Counsel, Government Code Section 54956.9A, Keep Fort Ord Wild versus Fort Ord Reuse Authority, Monterey County Superior Court Case Number 17 CV 4540. And 4C, Conference with Legal Counsel, Government Code Section 54956.9D, One Matter of Significant Exposure to Litigation. Okay, before we uh go into closed session. Is there any public comment on any of those items? Seeing none, we'll go to closed session.
Lucas back. All right. Okay, Authority Council, will you read us out of closed session? Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, members of the board and public, uh, the board met in closed session um, on item 4A, Conference with Legal Counsel, Government Code Section 54956.9A, Marina Community Partners versus Fort Ord Reuse Authority. Uh, the board was informed of the status of, of that matter uh, and took direction from counsel, and there's nothing to report out on that matter. Um, 4B, Conference with Legal Counsel, Government Code Section 54956.9A, Keep Fort Ord Wild versus Fort Ord Reuse Authority. Uh, the board was also informed of the status of that case um, and took direction from from counsel, uh, made uh, and, and took counsel's recommendations. There's not anything to report out on that matter. Uh, and 4C conference with legal counsel, government code section 54956.9D, one matter of sig significant exposure to litigation. Uh, the board heard from counsel on that matter, and there's nothing to report out. Thank you. Okay, um, can we have roll call, please? Supervisor Parker, Supervisor Phillips, Here. Supervisor Adams, Here. Mayor Edelin, Here. Council Member O'Connell, Council Member Morton, Here. Council Member Hoffa, Here. Mayor Rubio. Here. Council Member Alexander, Here. Mayor Carbone, Here. Mayor Gunter, Here. Council Member Garfield, Here. Council Member Reimers, Here. Kathleen Lee, Nicole Hollingsworth, Here. Erica Parker, Here. Debbie Hale, Here. Dr. Diffenbaugh, Here. Steve Matarazzo, Here. Andre Lewis, Here. Hugh Hardin, Here. Bill Collins, Here. Dr. Tribley, Lisa Reinheimer and Dr. Moore. You have a quorum. Thank you. Well, the next item on the agenda is a consent agenda, which consists of approved the March 7, 2018 special meeting minutes, approved the March 9, 2018 meeting minutes, the Administrative Committee Report, Veterans Issues Advisory Committee Report, Water Wastewater Oversight Committee Report, the Building Removal Quarterly Report the Environmental Services Cooperative Agreement Quarterly Report and Public Correspondence to the Board. Is there anyone on the on the dais who would like to pull any of those for further consideration? Anybody in the public? Is there any public comment on the consent agenda? Okay, seeing none, I will entertain a motion. There's a motion to approve as presented. All those in favor? Opposed, motion carries unanimously, thank you. The next item is um, business item 8A, fiscal year 2017-2018, mid-year budget section 115 trust. This is the second vote. Mr. Hulamart. Yes, uh, chair staff has a very <coughs> brief uh, comment on this. Uh, the last item was uh, discussed at considerable length at the last meeting. We have representatives from PARS here to describe all of their programs in the board voted uh, 12 to 1 to approve. This requires a second vote. Okay. Okay, uh, let's get the second then under the question. We'll get, we'll take. Okay. Um. I speak so rarely. <laughs> <laughs> At, at the March 9th meeting, uh, Board Member Edelin made a motion relating to the uh, 15, 115 trust in which he requested, and it was voted on by the board, that we be provided with uh, various areas to be invested in each year and uh, how much was made or lost in each of these areas. I don't see that in here. And maybe I missed it. And secondly, on page... 23 of the staff report makes reference to a cost, I believe, to Highmark Capital Management of a half a percent, which my understanding would be $25,000 per year on a $5 million. Can, do we have any indication, since we most likely will, could possibly sunset in two years, that this is going to be profitable to anyone? I don't. I don't have enough information personally. 
here, um, Gail, then uh, Ms. Crutcher. So I would echo, I was the no vote because my concern <coughs> is we would be paying fees, which the three entities that were identified, the agency that sets up the trust, U.S. Bank, and then the investors would all be taking fees. And as a finance committee member, perhaps I'm received and the rest of the board didn't, but what our cash and investment balances, this was sent to us this week, where our CDs are earning 1.2%. And in a two-year investment, my question is, are we going to garner net more than if we put this money into just a CD at much less cost of staff time, cost of fees in and out of funds, and the creation of the fund. And and for that reason, that's why I voted against it, because we only have two years, and it's greater risk in the market in what they would be investing in. I'm, I really want to preserve these funds for fulfilling our obligation when we sunset. Ms. Corp. Yeah, I'd like to build on that. Um, is there are two things in here, and I, I apologize, I wasn't here last month, so it may have been discussed, but I wanted to bring up two issues. One is that this is not a prepayment of our CalPERS obligation. This is a sequestering of funds for the purpose of pension obligations. It could be our unfunded liability, it could be regular could be anything, but it, the way that the 115 trust is written is it is not a prepayment, although those funds are secured for pension obligations. The second thing is, is that for funds that are needed within a two-year period of time, one to two-year period of time, the most prudent investment is the safest investment and very close to cash equivalents. So it, this is, in my opinion, I would vote for this, but not because it promises extra gains, but because it secures it for its safety and the security that these funds will be used as intended for the benefit of both the employees who depend on these, these payments and the, the, the jurisdictions that are involved in this for our protection as well. So those are the two reasons I would say to vote for it, but I think that the wording of pre-funding is a little misleading and the phrase of so some municipalities use section 115 trusts so that they can invest in higher yielding investments which by their very nature are higher risk and absolutely not to be recommended if the funds are needed within two years so I would say that when we get to what the investment protocol is, that's when we have a discussion of what we invest in. But I think it's well worth doing, even if we're paying something for it, for that security and safety of sequestering those funds. So thank you, Your Honor. Um, Jerry? Yeah. Well, very quickly, I think uh, Director O'Connell and Director Morton make good, some good points, but I think that information will be brought back to us later on. All we're doing now is a second vote, I believe, to authorize the executive officer to negotiate mm -hmm. the associated contract document. So once that negotiation is done, I believe what will happen is he will bring back to this board the specifics, including the potential losses and gains, um, exactly what it's going to cost us over what kind of period of time, in which case this board at that time will make the decision of whether or not we want to finalize to go into this, uh, this trust or not go into the trust. I believe that's correct. Mayor so Chair, my understanding is that in two years, four is going away. I look at it and think for 20 years now, we voted on everything twice, so we've done 10 years worth of work. We should all be very proud of that. <laughs> Most people, if we were building houses, they would fire us. But I look at it this way. There are still barracks to be torn down. There's still work to be done. And if we don't invest this money and tie it up into a fund that it cannot be frittered away foolishly or not so foolishly, depending upon which city is going to use this money to their benefit. Every one of the cities here that does not have land use, the county shares three times because they have three members. The amount of money each of these cities would owe in two years is going to be rather phenomenal. And if you think you have budget problems now, wait three years and try to come up with a million dollars Monterey County. By then it'll be a million dollars Salinas. We're going to leave employees without benefits and we're going to 
not wisely take care of the money we're obligated to take care of as a board. Any other comment? Um, I just have a question. Uh, truthfully, why do you feel that this, uh, what is it, the 115 trust is more secure than the uh, CDs in which we're now invested where we're earning 1%, 1 percent, 1 X percent, 1 point X percent? May I answer? Yeah. Um, the, the CDs, while they might be safer as an investment vehicle, the funds from those can be allocated to anything. They are within our general fund. And so if you and I are not here, someone else may decide that they want to use all of those funds for something other than the unfunded pension liabilities. That's certainly an option that's open. I don't want that to be an option. So I want okay. the what the 115 trust does is say that the funds invested in the 115 trust, however they turn out to be invested, are to be used only for pension obligations. Totally and get that. That's why. So okay, thank you. And then may I just come back for clarification again? So is if we felt that the money is going to make more money if we leave it in CDs, can we simply sequester the money or you know tie it up so that it's um, definitely just for um, pensions, but we're still going to be earning a better interest without having all of the additional fees that would come from setting up this particular trust? We're not aware of uh, CDs that would give us more of a return than what the professionals say had last month. Um, their past performance has been fairly significant in government-backed securities, which would fit within our portfolio of recommendations. Uh, they do believe that they would probably return like what they've done in the past. Again, they answered the question about the risk last time, but they've been at between 5 and 6%. But I'm assuming something half of that. I'm figuring probably 2.5, 2.6, probably with a 5 0.52 basis points of cost. The ultimate is probably a little over 2% and 1.2% is what we're getting in CD. So there's some dollars that we would get. Councilwoman Morton's concern is, is that those extra dollars, whatever that is, 25 or 30,000 on 5.7 million, is it worth it to put it there? It can well, be in the staff time as well. That's understood. The answer is yes. That's what our staff recommendation is, but it but primarily because I think, as Councilwoman uh, Garfield. Cynthia Garfield has indicated, uh, there's also that protection for all the jurisdictions that the money is set aside, not prepaid, set aside in the Section 115 Trust for this purpose. If, um, Dr. Kribley, can um, Ms. Garfield, and then, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just as a uh, one example of a government agency putting money aside in a trust. We did so uh, somewhere near the fall of 2016, about $3 million in an irrevocable trust, $1 million in a liquidity fund, and those two investments have earned $750,000 towards those other post-employment benefits other than retirement benefit. And that's the way that money then can make the money to cover responsibly our retirees and not take away funds from the operations and the service to students. So the money is making money for that purpose versus carving out of the general fund uh, the total amount that's going to be needed to cover. So it actually, in my opinion, it's a great way. Of course, we're gambling on the markets, but uh, we are trying to preserve the funds and for to do the work of four. So I certainly, if I had a vote, I would vote to take the next step. Ms. Corfield. Um, thank you. I, 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 by the way, I took a class in this, so it's not that I already knew this stuff, but I took a class in this so, <laughs> on the Section 115 Trust. So when we invest them within a 115 Trust, you are put into a set-up portfolio of options. They have A, B, C, D, E, blue, green, red, whatever, and we can make a choice about those. And they range all the way from the kind of equity-heavy investments that a municipality might want if they anticipate a 30-year horizon, so that that exists as, a, as an option. What also exists as an option is all the way to the most conservative, so it really is almost exactly like what we do for our general fund, or even more conservatively, or cash equivalents. So we will have an array of options of how we want to invest these funds. I think that the primary thing is 
safety of the funds and not losing capital and securing it for the purpose of protecting our employees and our municipalities. And, and frankly, I don't care if it costs us a little bit of extra money to do so. I really feel strongly about those two, two reasons for, for supporting a 115 trust in this circumstance. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, so my suggestion, because it's been the two-year horizon, the short term of this horizon, the cost that's associated with staff setting this up, review by the board on what we're going to agree to invest in, all of this adds up, that it would seem that we would be able to net equivalent funds or near equivalent funds by taking what we have already as a board decided was to be earmarked for the CalPERS obligations and creating its own CD at the highest rate for the two years and that the growth and all of that would be there because it would be in its own identified CD. This board, in putting it into the trust, the difference is that it's irrevocable, meaning it can never be changed. But this board has made a decision for, since Ian Oglesby sat with me in 2015 on the Finance Committee meeting, and then Mr. Mayor Gunther, we also added to that in the last year's mm -hmm. Finance Committee, and this full board has approved the earmarking of this money to fund our long-term liability and our shutting down in 2020. I believe that we have a greater security in putting the money into a CD and just saying there's the CD to fund this obligation. This is going to be considered by the transition task force. We've set it as a board policy and we're all interested in doing that. I do have a problem with it being repeated over and over, a misstatement about the law, about current law is that the jurisdictions are not responsible for any underfunding. That is what the current law states. But between now and 2020, that law may change. But by putting it into a CD and it's protected, it's earning guaranteed money, there's no risk, and that growth is also being added, we're fulfilling our obligation to our employees. All of us want to fulfill those obligations. I'm trying to do it at the least amount of cost, the least amount of guesswork, and the least risk. Mr. Hopper. Yeah, I'd like to move approval of the staff recommendation. There's already a motion. Oh, there is, okay. There's a motion and a second for the staff recommendation. Is then there? I, it comes. Go ahead. So I, I just um, thank Director Garfield for um, helping me understand this better. And my concern is that if it isn't in a secured fund this way in 2020, when it seems likely for a sunsets, it seems likely there'll be lawsuits over liabilities and assets, and I think we need to be absolutely certain that um, our pension liability is protected in this fund. So, okay. Ms. Ryan. Um, I have a question that I should have asked in advance. Uh, the amount that we're suggesting was, would be $5,700,000 into this trust. My understanding is there's about $7 million set aside now my question is why is not the entire, is there a rationale for not putting the entire seven million into the trust? The, the, this was the recommendation of the finance committee and the executive committee uh, and our staff concurs that holds about a million dollars back after, pre, after paying for some of the other pension costs, unfunded actuarial liability costs, we're paying that off. So that still leaves a million dollars in the CD uh, that could be converted and applied to this later if the board so chose to do. But this gives the board more flexibility. We also don't know absolutely for sure that our obligation is going to be the seven point whatever it is today. It may be less or more. And so this gives the board an, an opportunity to hedge their bets and still have some flexibility to use for other things if the full 7.3 million that's estimated now is going to be required. And, and also, I would understand that the million that, that's still available can be used to pay the yearly uh, expectation as well. So it leaves some flexibility then. 
Okay, thank you. If the board decides. Okay, I'm going to take it out to the public. Is there any public comment on this item? See, and then I'll bring it back um, for action. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We don't need to. We could. You want to roll call? No? Okay. So you had uh, two dissenting? Very good. Okay, item 8D is the resolution approving the adoption of the Public Agencies Post Employment Benefits Trust administered by the Public Agency Services. Mr. Hulamart. Yes, uh, Chair, members of the board, to an extent you've already uh, had the exchange on this item. I really have very little to add other than we're recommending uh, <coughs> that now that the second vote is taken on the prior action, that the board adopt the attached resolution authorizing participation in the Public Agencies Post Employment Benefits Trust to be administered by the Public Agency Retirement System and authorizing the Executive Officer to execute the PAR's administrative documents and take necessary actions to maintain the authority's participation in the program and maintain compliance of any relevant regulation issued or may be issued. I suggest that it'll take a little while to pull all these pieces together and uh, the information that uh, Council Member O'Connell Mayor Edelin and others have requested we can bring back to the board and describe this in more detail next month, since I expect there might be a need for a second vote. Anyway. Okay, any questions for staff? Any public comment? Oh, yes. Yeah, just one question. Um, there are several different categories of the type of trust, of the, the funds we can put in that trust. I, I assume we this board for a decision as to which one of those specific uh, um, uh, investment vehicles that we're going to go into, plus the, the, the potential uh, gain or loss of that vehicle over the last couple, let's say five years or so. Yes, we can do that, and uh, we can bring it back for your information next month. Uh, the recommendation by the PARS staff was to be consistent with the existing Port Ordered Reuse Authority policy, so it would have the same level of risk that you've already authorized. We're not going to be bringing back a recommendation to alter for a board policy, but we will bring that back and the performance information you're asking for. Okay, a, a question. Uh, worst casing it, in other words, there will be a final vote by this board on the specific fund that we're going to invest in, is that correct? That's your desire. I don't know how many votes that might take. Good point. Uh, I, I, I would uh, I would move that uh, we go with staff recommendation. However, we want to. I'd like to have it brought back to this board with the potential loss and gain information for each one of the specific uh, investment vehicles, so that everybody here can take a look at it, uh, uh, digest it, make a make a, a final decision on wh where we want to go for an investment. I think that's you know, the only uh, right thing to do. Okay, is there any, um, okay, there's a motion, sir, there's a second, um, is there public comment? Okay, so um, that would no normally go through Finance Committee and Executive Board before it gets here. Well, it, I think both Finance Committee and Executive uh, Committee both had presentations from the professionals that right. had the performance information. The full board hasn't seen all of that. Right. We'd be bringing all of that back. So. Okay. All right. Everybody, uh, any other question? Anything on the question? All those in favor? Opposed? Okay. The next item is item C. Regional Urban Water Augmentation Project and Three-Party Planning Water Augmentation sub Study Report. Yes, uh, Chair, the Board has asked that we periodically provide you with updates on the progress we're making with the work that we've engaged with Monterey One and Marina Coast Water District, and Peter Said will make this presentation. Thank you very much, Board. Thank you, Mayor Rubio. Um, this is a few of the presentation, but I'm just going to sum a few things up and let you know where we're at with uh, Ruat Pipeline, which is the Regional Urban Water Augmentation Program. Uh, we're going to talk about the construction status, some upcoming uh, items that are happening with that program, 
And then we're going to be talking about the planning study, where that's at, and that'll be real brief in some of the action items there. So the Ruat Pipeline, our Purple Pipe Project, is um, got a little bit of background to it. These You've seen these charts before. This is really just to sum it up and point out that in 2015, PCA, um, that's the Monterey Regional Water Pollution Control Agency, which is now named Monterey One Water, for those of you who don't know, approved aligning their pipeline with the uh, Marina Coast Water District's pipeline. And it went through a series of discussions at numerous boards and eventually ended up here at the Fora Board where we um, uh, passed a resolution um, approving it. And then it came back in t June 2017 uh, for, uh, sorry, I came back in September 2016 for a six million dollar reimbursement agreement whereby FOR would apply six million dollars of its capital improvement program funds towards water augmentation and the board unanimously approved that reimbursement agreement with MCWD. In June 2017 they went for the state resolving, uh, revolving fund funding approval and that is basically a large loan from the California uh, state uh, at really low interest rates, and they were uh, that was approved. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then what's happening as of December 15, uh, December 2017 to today has been a number of uh, items that we'll discuss here. So, in uh, uh, additional background, you may have seen this little diagram that we put together uh, for you before. The regional urban water program six million dollar reimbursement was based on two contracts. The first was a contract between um, Monterey One Water and MCWD whereby they agreed how to split the um, cost, the pipeline, how to who gets what water, how much water, that, that whole agreement. Built on the back of that agreement was the agreement between Monterey, uh, between Marina Coast Water District and Fora whereby we agreed to you know put six million dollars into this combined project. As you may remember, the pipeline went from um, the uh, pump station out at the uh, PCA's facility all the way down into Seaside uh, and up to a very large reservoir just uh, east of uh, what everybody knows as Black Horse Golf Course. Uh, it's called the Black Horse Reservoir. And this little blue bit that is uh, a little shapely off to the right uh, moves water from the reservoir into the um, um, uh, PCA's facilities and then that moves out of the PCA's facilities down into the rest of the peninsula via uh, various pipes. So this is a good group of people who were there at the groundbreaking. We've actually started construction on this pipeline. Um, you see them moving the dirt around and then you see the real people moving the dirt around. <laughs> so <laughs> Um, this is uh, they're moving this pipeline in two segments they're starting both at Armstrong Ranch uh, which is out uh, uh, to the north of Marina and then also you see this coming along General Jim Moore through the uh, Ord military community um, and they're laying that pipe pretty quick uh, I like to say they're buying American um, and this is the Black Horse Reservoir you see the existing reservoir tank off uh, in the distance and this is the uh, much larger reservoir the foundations that are being put in for that reservoir um, Everything the construction is going on pretty smoothly. Uh, there is a, a, a something coming up in June where there's a concern about um, uh, making sure that all, all agreements are in place, but everything's moving along fairly well at this point. So, for those of you who don't know, the six million dollar reimbursement agreement was split into four payments. Those payments, that payment schedule is there up on top, and then down below you see the actual reimbursement and carryovers that have happened. So uh, in 2016-17, 324,000 went to the engineering. We reimbursed 900,000 this year in 2017-18, and there is an estimated two million for next year as a project carryover, which was a part of the agreement. Carryovers were part of the agreement. And in 1920, there's three more million dollars that um, uh, is left remaining on the contract. Or sorry, in 2020. So those things I said we'd get back to. This is that slide. Uh, the state revolving fund uh, was approved, but it was approved separately, one for Monterey One Water and one for Marina Coast Water District, and that changed the underlying assumptions of the first agreement. Um, that change in the underlying assumptions went through a, 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 about a six-month discussion about how to split uh, grant dollars and the four distribution, as well as a number of other technical details. But uh, Marina Coast Water District and uh, Monterey One Water sorted that out, 
But now it comes back to Fora as we have to resolve uh, a number of uh, issues having to do with our reimbursement agreement. And it's going to uh, involve making some amendments and changes to our current agreement with MCWD. And then it's also going to involve uh, a tertiary agreement between MRWPCA whereby we transfer $2.3 million from one agreement over to the other one. Um, both of those agreement changes will need to come forward to the board, and we anticipate that, uh, bringing that for your consideration in June. So June is when we would look at some of that language change in errata. That's the Regional Urban Water Oper Augmentation Program, the Purple Pipe. The three-party planning is different. Uh, I put three hands in there. That's a unique handshake, but um, this one is, like I said, real simple. March 2016, uh, there was an agreement between the three parties to do a planning study on where the future water augmentation would come from. Uh, we put together a technical advisory committee and reviewed a scope in January 2017. We put that out for proposal, a request for proposal. We received zero proposals, and so we got kind of stuck there as, as no one wanted to bid on that. And then right following on the heels of that, uh, between June and December, um, MCWD and Monterey on Water were sorting out their uh, agreement. And so there was uh, some time that happened in there. And December 2017, just this last December, all the general managers and the executive officer got together and said, all right, what's the fastest way to move this thing forward? Um, and in the original planning agreement, we had Fora as the lead, and we determined that if MCWD takes on the lead for the planning study, we could probably move this forward a little bit faster. Fora would still approve the scope of work deliverables um, and, and, and approve the invoices, essentially. Um, and this would require some minor adjustments in the existing three-party planning agreement, and we plan on bringing that forward to you next month at the, uh, uh, for your consideration. Uh, that's where we're at. Any questions on the water program? Okay. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, are there any questions for Mr. Saeed? Okay. Anything from the public? Any public comment? Seeing none, then we'll... It's a good presentation. You answered all the questions. We'll deem that uh, received. The next item is the transition planning update. Uh, Ms. Damon. Thank you, Chair Rubio, members of the board. We're loading up here. I know it's your favorite time of the day, the transition planning update. Try to keep it focused and brief. That's been my direction. So next slide. There we go, we're gonna talk about that. We have basically three charts that are being updated for your information, and we're gonna just outline the transition ad hoc committee schedule. Whoopsie, it was so fast, we went right over it. Our next TAC meeting is April 18th at 1230. And May 9th is potential future date at 3 p.m. and on May 30th. So we have three meetings lined up. There will be sandwiches available at the um, 1230 ones. Just saying this, for a $10 contribution for those sandwiches. <laughs> All right, just so we don't run afoul of for a policy we do not buy lunch for our committees. Um, here's your schedule. We've rolled this out. This is a slightly update showing the subject matter summaries coming before the board to keep us on schedule for board consideration, ultimate board adoption of a transition plan, um, draft final to board in the August, September t time frame. The draft, pre-draft final plan will be rolled out to the uh, TAC committee in the May, at the May 30th meeting is the goal. And it will be a draft subject to obvious revisions, negotiations, etc. Ongoing meetings with LAFCO staff. And again, the final, final outside date of October. So that's right in line with our time frame. final LAFCO application by December. Whoops. Whoops. Oh, come on. Here is the transition plan. This is what your transition plan chapters look like. There's gonna be an executive summary. The uh, chapters that are underlined are ones that have come forward to this board already. So the board members have the draft tables with the anticipated assignments. Board members can discuss that amongst yourselves all you want, because ultimately it, this will be your plan with your assignment lists but we have been continuing to roll those out for discussion and consideration by all. Uh, 
Today we're going to add number G, the miscellaneous contracts chapter compilation of the um, contracts and documents out there. And then a final conclusion. I'm just going to apologize in advance. There is no easy way to show these charts. Um, there are a lot of contracts that affect FORA's operations in the water wastewater arena. You previously have seen this chart with the same list of obligations contracts on the left hand side. The difference is before in the assignment column we were proceeding under the JPA, the single entity modeling. This now reflects a multi-agency modeling of it. Sherry, uh, this is available online. This is available online. It's also in your board packet right. as well. It's in under the TAC tab. It is not under the TAC tab as of yet. It is in your board. It's it's on the board agenda. But it will agenda. be. I can, we definitely can make all the chapters and the summary charts available on the TAC webpage. No problem. Thank you. So you can see that there's a, we've updated the table to reflect the comments from MCWD that they made at the January meeting, that there's nothing to assign in terms of the uh, water deed. There, the deed is already to them, but there are obligations in that deed that benefit FORA and those FORA would assign to the jurisdictions for the most part and to CSU. MPC is receiver. Everybody who's got a water allocation has an interest in making sure that the contract terms of the deed are continue to be followed. Oops. Financial, we've done the same thing. This is mainly your implementation agreements. When we were under the single agency model, the thought was all the implementation agreements were assignable and we rolled out the first part of a two-part legal memorandum that said that those documents are assignable. This now shows the multi-agency um, format. You'll notice we've added MCWD because there are some water obligations that are included in the implementation agreements um, along with the financing provisions in the implementation agreements. So we've included everybody in there. It's a draft document. It's subject to change, but the idea is that as the obligations ultimately are assigned, the portions of the implementation agreements that are a benefit or an asset will be assigned to the entity that is taking the obligation. That's the, the thought process here. Miscellaneous, here are the new ones. So we have four new ones. This is, has been raised by the city of Marina. Um, so the building removal contracts were not captured in the earlier charts. Um, they are now captured here. There's a, a reimbursement agreement and there is a um, base agreement. Um, there are also two orders which are not arguably technically not contracts per se, but they are documents that there are obligations that go hand in hand with them. So they've been listed in this miscellaneous documents list. So you have the Sierra Club settlement, for example, and there's the um, other settlement agreement that is uh, listed there. And there may be other documents on here on the miscellaneous that I've missed, but this is what we have so far. And I would hope that if any board member says, hey, what about, I don't know what, they would bring it up and let me know because I may be good. I try to be very diligent and thorough and for staff try to be very diligent and thorough. But sometimes, you know, we are a team collectively and regionally we need to address this fully. So it helps us all to make sure that the lists are complete. Finally, what's new? This is not in your board report. And there's a legislative committee meeting coming up on April 23rd. They will discuss in more detail all of the pending legislation. However, I thought it was helpful to bring up some items that the legislative committee will address that may affect transition issues. Um, so we've talked previously about SB 50, the limitations on federal land transfers. There's a current pending bill, AB 3160, 
which tries to address that and exempt BRAC communities from that um, application of that law. So that's a, a good thing, and we expect that the Ledge Committee will continue to monitor that provision very closely. AB 3037 on redevelopment, there has been a lot of talk, it's been in the papers, about reenacting redevelopment laws for purposes of housing in particular and infrastructure. That may be of great interest to communities as we move forward in the transition process and post fora, that may be a viable tool to help make sure that things get completed with respect to base, uh, the reuse. And finally, the Mitigation Fee Act, very worth noting here, makes changes to how you can assess certain kinds of projects with your fees um, as we move forward and we get ready to create new financing mechanisms and cities, county in particular, this may affect how you collect the fees, how you craft the fee, and how you collect the fees. And there may be other ones, but these are the three that I thought uh, would be of most interest right now. And that concludes my report. Okay, questions for Ms. Damon. Ms. Martin. Yes, so at the Transition Task Force, in one of the tabs or the charts, was trying to break out what are the mitigations, the CEQA mitigations, and any board policies that we haven't fulfilled. And those should be their own charts. Chapters, you call them chapters. I just. So I think you're suggesting that the transition plan include a CEQA chapter. Is that a fair translation? Whether that is the CEQA mitigations, just those policies, or whether it's broader than that, there will be a CEQA part of the transition plan. I've outlined for this board previously that in the next budget cycle and coming up very, very quickly, we will be making some decisions about the nature and extent of what kind of environmental review we need to do with respect to the transition plan. Yes, and I'm not talking prospectively. What I'm talking about is what are we required as an agency to do as to the CEQA impacts from the base reuse plan. I, I, I want to see those broken out. And I know some of them are included in transportation. Some of them are included in the habitat management. Some of them might be included in the water but it benefits us to know what are absolutely mandatory versus what are planned policies. I think that's a, a really interesting way to put it. I think it's kind of reminded me that back here, oops, when we talked about um, the miscellaneous things, here might also go the general provisions, not just your CEQA mitigations, but your base reuse plan the recommendation to record the documents so that everybody knows, record the master resolution so everybody knows what rules we're, we're playing under. And I think that's related to the mitigation question as well. Yes, and I my understanding is that Jane Haynes actually came in a few years ago and checked our documents to make sure the base for use plan were incorporated in the deeds but somebody should verify that. But I thought that was very generous of someone as a volunteer that came in, researched that, and we made corrections. There were m multiple issues that Jane brought up that we sat down and went over. This was uh, six years ago? It's a long time ago. <laughs> Any other questions for uh, Ms. Damon? OK, anything from the public? Uh, Christy Markey, Supervisor Parker's Chief of Staff. And she regrets that she couldn't be here today. She's under the weather. Um, but just a comment that we want to share, and Jane has kind of made this comment before, but just it's good to perhaps say it again, that this process um, goes through probably 50 contracts, and some of those contracts are with multiple parties. And it says this contract will be assigned from this party to this party. And there's been no dialogue with any of the parties to the contract. This is an internal fora 
analysis. And you have to consider that some of the parties who are being assigned liabilities may disagree. And so, you know, I'll take an example, just one out of 50, uh, County of Monterey Implementation Agreement. It's being assigned to the County of Monterey, MCWD, the Habitat Cooperative in Tansy. I don't know what that means, and I don't know if MCWD and Tansy would agree or the County of Monterey. So we have asked um, County Council to start tracking and looking at this, and we've asked our RMA staff because they have confirmed with me again that nobody from FORA has approached any county staff to discuss whether we agree. So just saying again that uh, if Jane were here, she would say, my silence doesn't mean I agree with what's on the board. And I, I think that the, you know, because we don't, want to, we don't want to hear that in August and September when you present the final version and say, well, I presented all these charts and you didn't say anything. So just for the record, we're saying that nobody has approached the county to ask if we agree and nobody has approached any of the other entities. So if we think this is going to be smooth, I, you know, maybe it will be, but it might not be. So we can't assume that in August, September, when you come forward with some final version, that all the entities are going to agree with the analysis. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back. Any other questions or comments? All right. Comment. I have a comment. Oh. I just would like to echo, and I know I sit on the transition task force, and I know I challenge many of the facts or the representations in the PowerPoints that are presented there, because I do agree with what our uh, Ms. Parker's representative has said, is that different agencies read contracts differently, there are different facts, and how the transition task force to date, this task force has been, that staff is preparing these documents, staff prepares a PowerPoint, they're presented to us, but our meetings are so short, there's not a lot of discussion about what should be addressed or changed, or does anybody county have any concerns that they don't see addressed. We haven't gotten to that level. It's basically we're presented just like it is here to listen and maybe ask a couple of questions. So to the point, there may not be agreement. Mr. Moore. Just uh, one quick comment on that same topic. Um, obviously, MCWD's letters appeared in a few new places in these charts today. Um, but I will commit to asking my board to direct our staff to uh, get to work on exactly this issue of Marina Coast's opinions on these various agreements. Um, so I'm certainly hopeful that uh, for a staff will work with us on that so that we can try and make things uh, smooth going forward. And, yeah, and I, I think that um, we're we're asking a lot of staff to pull these things together and we're saying, okay, here's the agreements. Uh, who's going to be affected by these agreements could possibly have some interest in these agreements. And they've done that. Have they called every single one of those uh, people and talked to them about every single one of those agreements? Probably not. Uh, and that's part of the, the process. So we understand that. But uh, I think that for us as TAC, just to get our minds around of the you know, astounding number of agreements that have to be, you know, talked about and who they will probably be affecting. How they affect them, we haven't got to. But that may take a, a an all-day workshop. And we have, which would, you know... that's a great which, idea, Rob. That's a super idea. Well, before I commit everybody on attack to that, we have hard enough time finding, you know, uh, a day that, a day that everybody can have, you know, time to do what we do already. So that at the next TAC meeting, we'll, we'll talk about that. Could I add to that? Yeah. Thank you. I agree with that. It, it, it's exactly what it is that we need. I think as well, going to Tom's uh, comment, it, it, one of the things that could come out of that is some sort of a template that all of us within the jurisdictions can go back and ensure that, the, that our county councils all agree or feel that you know, we have the, the uh, information that we are getting the information from the various jurisdictions that's needed. And I don't think that we've really done that very well. So that's one of the 
uh, outcomes of the kind of uh, day-long process that you're talking about I think would be really, really good. And just a point of clarification, Chair, uh, with respect to uh, Mr. Moore's uh, comments, Forest Staff has met with your staff already to talk about transition issues, the kinds of amendments to agreements, et cetera, to make sure that the transitioning process, any gaps in the agreements or silence on certain other agreements are addressed and that we've collaborated and worked for, through those um, issues. So some of those conversations have started contrary to um, some of the thought process out there. Okay, thank you. Okay, the next one, Chair. Very, oh, yes. very quickly, like most a lot of the agreements up there you'll see are collective agreements. They're not broken down by specific land use jurisdiction, including the Habitat Conservation Plan. What Forest Staff's trying to do is what they're told to do to try and break down what specifically Delray Oaks's responsibilities in a, in a post breakup. What is Monterey? What is the Monterey's and so forth? The more we, at least the more I get into this, it's like trying to untie a Gordian knot. The responsibilities between, for the Habitat Conservation Plan are so, so uh, intensive and, and overlap so many jurisdictional boundaries. How we're going to do that is going to require the wisdom of Solomon. And I know we have the wisdom of Solomon on our staff and so forth. It's going to be very difficult. And you can see right now, we've got, and rightfully so, folks saying, look, I, don't, I may not agree to what my responsibilities are. Multiply that times all those agreements up there, multiply it times all the Habitat Conservation Plan, and you're looking at, in my case, a very strong argument for some sort of a for a light moving forward where, the, where we have collective agreements rather than try to un, unravel this mess uh, by jurisdiction. Okay, so um, let's uh, move on to the next item, which is 8E, Executive Committee Report from Michael. Yes, Chair, item 8E is uh, about two items that the board members asked that we return back to the board for consideration. One was what would happen when if a item was desired by a member of the board to be placed on the board agenda, how that would work. Uh, the executive committee is recommending that the board uh, consider that any member requesting a non-emergency item to be placed on the agenda submits it to the executive officer a few weeks ahead of time. The reasons for that are straightforward. The executive committee meets 10 days before the board meeting. The draft packet goes out two weeks before. We need to get it three weeks ahead if we're going to be able to consider that. And then, so that's one recommendation. The second recommendation here pertains to um, the questions that were posed by the board about the establishing general guidance about the nominating committee and the executive committee selection process. And so the executive committee, after reviewing the staff board, the staff report, which is included in your packet, I believe, uh, suggested that the, the executive committee uh, both adopt a statement on inclusiveness that would be part of a motion and that recommending establishing general guidance for the chair relating to the composition of a nominating committee that would have both executive committee and non-executive committee members and that a two-year rotation of officers that is inclusive of non-landowner and landowner jurisdictions be considered in participating in the executive committee. So those two items were reviewed in some detail by the executive committee. Many of the things that we're doing in these two items are affected a bit by the Ralph M. Brown Act and the Public Records Act for certain requests in each of them that affect how these things are done. And these also are intended to comply with the master resolution that already dictates certain terms and conditions and state law, which says what the chair is going to be, what the composition is going to be of the board, and so forth and so on. So these two recommendations are presented for the board's consideration in response to your request. Okay, um, Ms. Adams. Thank you very much. I just want to say thank you very much for, for taking this into consideration and for uh, giving the time and the thought to it. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other uh, questions or comments from the board? Mr. Hoppe. These look like really positive recommendations and uh, appreciate the uh, work of the executive committee on this. Okay, any others? Anything from the public? Seeing none, um, do we need a, an affirmative um, action on this? There's a motion and a second. Is there any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. The next item 
is uh, to receive a report on affordable housing and Monterey Bay Economics Partnership presentation. Mr. Lamar. Yes, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Chair. I want to recognize uh, many people in the room who have called me individually or called members of staff on this issue. It's an information item today and the only thing we're requesting is that you receive a report. It's an important report, however, and it was requested by our colleagues at the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership that they be able to provide an, a, a presentation. I, I want all to understand uh, that the work that the Fort Ord Reuse Authority has done with respect to affordable housing has been precisely from the very first day the Fort Ord Reuse Authority was created and in looking back in the intent for creating the Fort Ord Reuse Authority addressing housing needs in this area in after the closure of Fort Ord was included and in the intent for the legislature looked at the creation of the entity. It's important to also note that uh, support for affordable housing didn't just take the form of platitudes, it was very effectively integrated into the very first actions and property transfers that occurred on the, Fort, on the former Fort Ord, including when the California State University of Monterey Bay received its transfers early in 1994 and began the process of understanding what it would need to do to supply housing that would support affordability in this region and to provide housing for faculty, staff, and students within the confines of that campus so that it would minimize impacts on the region. In fact, any of you that watch the local news know that our colleagues at UC Santa Cruz are doing their long-range development plan and Landwatch original executive director Gary Patton was busy on the television today talking about the importance of affordable housing and the impact of overcrowding that's happened in Santa Cruz and the impact on the failure to have adequate roads to address that overcrowding on Highway 1 and other places in Santa Cruz. Uh, the, that continued as the Fort Ord Reuse Authority at the request of our great colleagues in the city of Marina took on the potential of leasing under a finding of suitability for lease the Preston Park project and then the Abrams Park project after that originally in 1997 and then later 1999 and 2000 each of those projects and significant numbers of units in both of those two developments were maintained as affordable housing forever almost, I and mean, the whole time City of Marina has operated, or Fora as our colleagues, one time as our agent, as our partner, uh, that project has both deed restricted units and is operated below market continuously. Same is true over the CSU and B housing from the original dates. That just wasn't where we stopped because in 2001 when we created our implementation agreements, actually 2000 and 2001, those implementation agreements call for complying with components in the master resolution that were adopted to address the demand for affordable housing. Under redevelopment, 15% is all that's required, but the Fort Ord Reuse Authority jurisdictions stood up and said 20% would be better than 15%. And so the jurisdictions stood for that in their redevelopment project adaptation. Beyond that, Congressman Farr said, you know, that's still not enough. We have to do more because we need employer-based and workforce housing in this region. And we created a special task force of four board members. I remember Edith Johnson was a part of that and Jerry Smith was part of that and others who were board members in the early part of the last decade and they created a housing trust. Steve Ensley from Fort Ord Reuse Authority staff went to all those meetings. Ron Cheshire was a board member. Um, Candy Ingram others in this room were activists for affordable housing, all part of the Fort Ord Reuse Authority and the regional recovery program, identified sites and came up with ways to do affordable housing. That included uh, long conversations with my friend Gary Patton, who again was on television this morning when he was with Landwatch, sitting down talking about compact growth and having Fort Ord be the location where we would build more intensively. Landwatch hasn't changed that opinion, but the idea was more compact growth and smaller units was affordability by design. So that was part of what we did as well. I even heard Bill Monning today talk about the importance of affordable housing in the region and talk about why housing production in this region is a major, reason, major problem for affordability. The fact that we are constraining production means the supply has outstripped, I mean the demand has outstripped our supply. I think those were the exact words that Senator Monning used today. So there are great concerns about all of that. 
At CSUMB, they've continued to deal with workforce housing, partnering with Marina and the Fort Ord Reuse Authority to be able to reduce fees and to be able to produce housing for students that keeps the students off of the private market so that it doesn't further exacerbate affordability in the region. That continues to be true. So all of that's true and all of the individual developments have projects that are affordable that are helping. Does that mean we have to stop? I think the challenge to this board and what Monterey Bay Economic Partnership is here to say is maybe all of these jurisdictions meeting in this regional entity would have the land to be able to do it maybe could do more. That's what we're talking about today. How do we make that happen? Granted we've done special employer-based housing and there's still consideration for that. Uh, there's a proposal that the UC received for one of their triangle parcels for agriculturally based housing. There was another that uh, in the city of Marina for teacher housing. I know MPC, CSU, MPUSD continue to all function along with other partners of CSUMB to have employer based housing as part of what CSUMB provides in this region. We need to do that kind and more and produce affordable for purchase. That might be moderate income or workforce housing that helps P.K. Diffenbach or Walt Tribley to be able to produce the kind of product that will attract the very best educators to our region so that we don't lose them all to the Central Valley. We have a great place to live here. It's not enough to get the best faculty and the best staff because they can't afford to live here. So I open up this comment with that and also note that in front of you, each of you have a chart Again, our friends have pointed out that maybe listing the housing that the United States Army provided, quite frankly, at a great benefit to our region. We partnered with the Army uh, earlier in the last decade to create the parks, Monterey Bay communities, where the Army is providing employer-based housing for the mission in this area. That mission is critical to all of us in our economic sense. Some of that housing is used to benefit in the um, the open market as well because it's available to the open market when there are units available not being taken up by the military or others. So that is a part of our employer-based housing and at the behest of the colonel when some units are not being used some of that housing is also used for homeless veterans in this region and maybe many of you did not know about that. Certainly the encephalopod that lives at the bottom of the Monterey Bay didn't know about it. So. I want everyone to understand that there is significant commitment that this board has made over its 24 year existence to affordable housing. City of Marina has led most in terms of production, but everyone's made a commitment to make that happen, whether it's the uh, smaller projects like the Salvation Army project that was built by the folks that built Seaside Highlands as part of their affordable commitment or whether it's something more significant like the workforce housing that Marina is being produced right here in the dunes. All of those are significant contributions and again my comment here is doesn't mean we can't do more. That's why I'm introducing Kate Roberts who will take you through a presentation about what the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership has, is requesting today. Thank you, Michael. Good afternoon, board. Uh, chairman, thank you for giving us this opportunity. Can I just say, is anyone else having a really wacky Friday the 13th? <laughs> Traffic is just insane. And I'm, I have to apologize that one of our presenters that we had hoped would be here, Simon, uh, Sibley Simon, who was the co-author on the paper that's in your packet, unfortunately got caught in some of that awful traffic. So. Um, we're going to be one short today, but we're still going to take a, a few minutes to give you an update on this paper that um, you have up uh, in your packet. But first, I just wanted to say a few things. Again, Kate Roberts, president of the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership. I'm going to introduce my uh, colleague here, Matt Huerta, in a minute. But for those of you that aren't familiar with us, we, we have been around since 19, uh, I'm sorry, since 2015. And our goal is to improve the economic health and quality of life for everyone throughout the Tri-County region. We have now over 80 members, and we are a membership-based organization. Uh, we continue to build on our successes and gain momentum in expanding our initiatives, our staff, and the breadth of our services. Uh, we have an annual budget of about 800000 now, and have just recently uh, been told by a major funder that we're going to be getting a big chunk of money to extend the work that we're doing in housing that we will hear more about next month. 
I just wanted to say Fora is a valued member. We depend on members for uh, our financial sustainability, and we're grateful to all those here in the room that are members of MBEP. Um, they've been there since the beginning, joining in July of 2015 and supporting us with an annual $10,000 a membership fee, which we are very grateful for. They've also sponsored several of our events and convenings where we, our goal is to bring cross-sector and cross-regional folks together to really think how we can solve our problems that we're all facing, getting out of our silos and thinking more holistically. Um, we have several initiatives. You're going to hear about the housing today, but we do a lot in workforce development. We do a lot in, in bringing technology to the region and ubiquitous broadband. And uh, we've just taken on a new initiative, because we don't have enough to do already, apparently, uh, in transportation, which is a really uh, exciting new area that we're delving into and have a really wonderful transportation advisory committee that we're engaging in that effort. And on a personal note, I just wanted to, to note that I really enjoy working with Fora. Uh, Josh Metz, who couldn't be here today as their economic development person, we've worked on workforce development, on other exciting opportunities to bring to the region. So uh, personally, I've really enjoyed the relationship that we, uh, we have with Fora. So today we're here to take a few minutes of your time to um, bring you some of the, uh, really some highlights from this paper that is in your packet. Um, as part of our housing initiative, which is a three-pronged effort, we do do, to follow up on a few things Michael said, we do focus on employer-sponsored housing as one piece of the, of the puzzle to solving our housing crisis. How can we get more school districts, more uh, healthcare operators, more uh, ag companies to think about how they could use land that they own to build housing on it so they can attract and, and retain employees, and so we don't lose them to other parts of the state. So that's a big part of what we do. We also have started the Monterey Bay Housing Trust, which now has over $12 million in uh, low-cost funding that's available to um, re sort of fill the gap that redevelopment left us with. So that's going gangbusters. We have several loans in process there. And thirdly is doing things like we're doing today. It's really thinking about how we can apply more uh, advocacy efforts around good projects, good policies that will create more housing in our region. So we, um, we hired Sibley Simon to do this work, to work with Matt um, last year, and we announced the initial findings at our State of the Region event last fall. And then we uh, made that into this white paper that you see. But those of you that know MBEP and have heard this presentation, actually I know a few of you in, around the table have already heard this. Um, Mayor Gunter and a few others, um, know that we are very action oriented and we don't like to just make all this effort and have it sit in a drawer. So we are here and taking this sort of on the road, if you will, to all the jurisdictions throughout the Tri-County area, meeting with boards of supervisors, meeting with city councils, helping them understand that there are some low hanging fruit, some things that they can do in a short time period that really will improve the supply of housing in their jurisdictions. So we're very honored to be able to bring you uh, to your board today, share some of these ideas, and uh, we'll, uh, with that, I'm going to introduce the real expert on this, Matt Huerta, MBEPS Housing Program Manager. There's no applause? What's going on around here? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Not for, not for me, for, for Kate. Okay. Um, thank you again, uh, Chair, Board. Um, hopefully we can get through this just a few minutes, and I'd love to field any questions you have. Again, Sibley can't be here. He's definitely the, the smarter between the two, so um, let's let's go through this uh, together real quick. And I just, there we go. Um, many of you are familiar with the, the numbers, just so that we kind of orient ourselves. We all kind of kill each other over the, the uh, regional housing needs assessments. You know, they kind of come down from the state. We figure out you know how to allocate them to each each city we sign up for them whether we like them or not and we tried to hit those goals one thing to remember about our goals is that they are super low I liken it to getting a D because these are forward projections based on census data primarily and it doesn't capture the pent-up demand that we know is there we don't need necessarily the form worker housing study that's going to come out next week to tell us that we have a uh, just immense overcrowding in too many of our neighborhoods. We know these stories, we hear it all the time, um, but we have to start somewhere. And so our housing elements across the region reflect the goals here in our, uh, re uh, our uh, regional um, housing goals. So for Monterey, Monterey County jurisdictions, they all add up to the 7,386 7, number and um, something to orient ourselves. So I did 
pick a few jurisdictions, forgive me, I had to pick a couple to fit on the slide, uh, but essentially the theme is is that we're all behind. So if we take the seven year period, we're nearing 50%, none of us are getting there. We're all in this together, we need to, to you know, get on, on a horse and gallop along here to, to try to catch up if we can. That's really what we're here to talk about. So in terms of housing affordability, what we're trying to say is that in, in studying all the various um, the, the various housing types that we see in our housing ecosystem, they start with the high impact, the stuff that we all celebrate in terms of achieving the biggest impact for our community uh, benefits are around the subsidized affordable housing. This is the senior housing, this is the farm worker housing, the formerly homeless units that we have uh, for folks that have disabilities, the amazing work that our nonprofit leaders and others are doing along with the jurisdiction partners to make that happen. That's certainly the highest impact. As we go further, you know, it's still obviously an impact and improvement to the community, but you know, felt by, by, by less, less and folks that, that need less support. That's really what this is about. So as we keep going, um, we're saying that you know the high price for sale obviously has the most benefit for the folks that are able to live there. And yet, when you look at what we're actually building across our our region, the biggest uh, production level is at the high price for sale. And we fortunately, again, do have a larger dot there at the high impact because we do obviously all focus our, a lot of energy on the, the um, subsidized homes, very little in between. So you can see we have a very skewed housing type ecosystem. And that's really what we need to break. We need to figure out how can we break that because even if we were to produce more housing, do we want it to look like that? We can't. It's not sustainable. We're not achieving production for the folks that truly need it the most. So that's really what this is about in terms of how can we get to a um, set of policies and decisions and housing production and planning that produces this kind of result, a more balanced approach, um, a more balanced ecosystem that is more sustainable for our region. And so we take other, you know, we all have the plans in front of us in terms of, of, of uh, analyzing the problem and policy opportunities that, that we set forth. We have to set specific goals. Um, we have to change the policy to increase production and decrease costs wherever possible. And of course, measure progress on the policy, production, and affordability of those plans. In terms of our, our policy paper, we really started with looking at, um, the, to Kate's point, the low-hanging fruit. What are the things that we can do on the shorter term without having a drawn out uh, you know, environmental assessment uh, period and, and the fighting that will ensue when we try to upzone particular properties or look across zoning code changes. Those take lots of time, lots of energy. That needs to happen, but we all re understand that there's time involved with that. So um, things that can happen on the short term that we're encouraging jurisdictions to do, as an example, are scaling the fees per square foot. There's something wrong when developers, okay, can are incentivized essentially to build these large homes because if if I'm a developer and I'm going to be charged the same fee whether I build a 400 square foot studio or a 4,000 square foot house I think the decision is kind of made for me before I even go and I've talked to many market rate developers across our region and they say look Matt I'm just I'm filling in the box I'm going to do the maximum within the framework that is put before me because that's that's what I do and that's what that that's what our system does. So we need to change the system. We need to create the right kind of box and framework so that we get the right output. And that's really what that is about. Uh, measuring density in far versus bedrooms or height and not units per acre. We really get stuck on okay, this is six units per acre. That's eight units per acre. But we lose sight in the f uh, fact that you know what we're really trying to do is is get the look and feel of a floor area r ratio or bedroom count and achieve uh, maximum. Uh, again, production for, for people, right? And so we have these nine recommendations. I, again, um, invite you to, to read that in more detail. We can follow up in terms of each of your jurisdictions. We're already working with um, City of Salinas subcommittees, uh, folks in, in Seaside, um, uh, Monterey County. Uh, we're moving forward with some recommendations there already and uh, look forward to digging in further. Just to highlight a couple 
as an example, the accessory dwelling units is something that's been piquing a lot of interest because folks um, feel like, hey, I can take that on, or I know somebody who has that that desire to, to create an ADU at, on their site, um, how can I go about doing it? Well, the state actually stepped in because the great ideas hadn't been producing very many ADUs, so they forced everybody, as you're well aware, to either get on board or you'd have to adopt their, their set of standards. And so there is some streamlining there. We can actually continue to go further and, and streamline those. So we have a set of recommendations to do that. Um, and we basically trying to, we're trying to, what we've done in our study is to try to look at jurisdictions that have been successful, not only here in our state, but elsewhere. So in Portland, as an example, they set forward very um, uh, proactive policies around ADUs and they've seen you know, a, a six-fold production just in the last few years on ADUs. And that's, that's not just because people decided to do it, it's because of the policies enabling those uh, decisions to, to move forward. The other area that, that uh, we ought to really take another serious look at in terms of what San Diego's been able to do um, is uh, look at how to, to utilize the existing framework that the state density bonus law gives us because um, that it automatically provides for incentives to developers to um, in order to access uh, opportunity to build more density on this on a site they have to achieve a certain uh, basically built-in inclusionary units right so they have to sign up for 10 percent up to 20 percent of units and they get up to a 35 percent density bonus right and this is on the base density this isn't have to go through some big expansive code change. This is on the base densities that you already have in your community, but again, looking at specific infill sites, other sites that can allow and produce some more housing for, for our community, and again, achieve some affordability within state bonus density law. And so the, the state allows that 35%, and actually we can take that up to even 100% on some sites when appropriate that allow for that. So we wanna see, um, is there opportunities to do that on, on specific sites here that, that we're all looking at? And again, other sets of policies that we've included, we did look at, well, what's the impact? Fine, Matt, we can make all these slick policies, but what's it really gonna achieve? Well, if we're really going to move the needle, we have to be able to reduce the, the cost of these homes. We have to have a different set of homes, not these you know, three, $4,000 homes. We gotta bring down the, the um, size and therefore bring down the, the cost structure, hopefully. And also, um, uh, when we're talking about different unit types, now we're talking of that ecosystem that we looked at before in terms of this starts to become a little more real. We're able to fill in some of these dots that are in the middle rather than having the, d the dumbbell um, that we have now. And that's really what our, our whole approach is. And again, there's real money involved in terms of cost savings, and that's uh, the primary way on how we're gonna get there. So without further ado, I would like to field any questions that you have about the presentation and policy. Thank you, Matt. That was a, a good presentation, a lot of information very quickly, and I, I think uh, reading the white paper will inform us more. Um, questions for, for Matt? Ms. Garfield. Yeah, thank you. There was a there was a slide that was just two ago that doesn't appear to be in the packet. It's uh, number three. It's a whole list of things you can do. Just some of goals. Which one? No, it's toward the end. It was oh. the second to last one that you did. And I was trying to take a picture, but it didn't keep on. Oh, uh, where did it go? It well, right. lists a whole thing. There it is. That's it. Um, do can we get that? Can we get this? I, so yeah. this is actually yeah. is in, that in the that it's in the packet. I'm sorry. So sorry, I missed it. Yeah. Where? So I don't have that in front of me, but it it's there's a list so of we, uh, near the end of the the um, policy paper. There's uh, a few charts and some listings of our estimates in terms of of the cost savings for some of these policy decisions on a. We'll, we'll make sure to get it level. to you. Um, if you Thank can't, you. if you can't, it, okay. Sixty one. Yeah. There we go. Thank you. Yes. On the Portland slide that you had up, do you know what incentives were? What, why did it shoot up six hundred percent? Right. So 
what we understand is that essentially they shifted away from such uh, very uh, strict um, requirements. One of the areas, as an example, if you look at our our page um, 11 and 12, it goes into a set of uh, a few bullet points in terms of what they did. As an example, there was no owner occupancy requirements on the ADU itself, right? So we said, look, we're so happy to get another unit, whether whether it's it's benefiting your your family member or on the marketplace, that's a new unit. We're happy to get that. Um, versus being more strict about how that that were to be um, occupied, um, there was furthering of lower, lowering parking requirements, recognizing that that um, you know having more folks living there, cost sharing or car sharing opportunities. Maybe this was on transit, uh, you know, driving these types of opportunities closer to to transit rich areas. Um, and then one thing I want to underscore on that one is having an easy online tool for assessing a property's eligibility and requirements under zoning rules. Because raise your hand, even those of us that are in this space, raise your hand if you, even if you had the, the, the wherewithal and, and the property, whether you know how to go through this whole process on your own to actually you know, find a contractor, get an architect, go through the whole process, right? So there's a, a current effort in San Jose as an example to pilot an ADU kind of a, a technical assistance program to help facilitate that. So there has to be at least some kind of online tool or some kind of res staff resource um, uh, available to help folks through this kind of process. Um, Supervisor Adams. Thank you, just a little worry. Uh, have you had to do much enforcement as far as worrying about the ADUs converting to short-term rentals? So short-term rentals come up and I get out of the, the room, so I'm not dealing with that. I'm not trying to, that's, that's not in our presentation, Mary. I'm just, uh, did you see anything? But I, so I'm not, a, I'm not aware of that particular item. But. Right, right, right. Okay, um, right. So they, they would, in that case, they would have to follow whatever rules that the jurisdiction would have in terms of, of those. So, so if that's a layer that, that jurisdictions are having in terms of, of the expectation for, for that, um, as an example, I know that some jurisdictions are really being cautious in terms of, of making sure that, that certain zones in their communities are allow for short-term rentals versus others that aren't, and then they dice between hosted and non-hosted, right? So this would have to comply with that. Okay, so we have uh, Gail, Luis, and then uh, Cynthia. So then thank we'll... you, Matt, for your presentation. and. The Post Reassessment Committee for Fora looked at this exact same <laughs> issue and actually had the two women that did this project and tried to look at how to get affordable housing down in San Diego come and address us. And so we, we have been trying to look at this and two things, and, and I'm trying to ask your agency to assist us to get over sure. these hurdles. And these hurdles were identified at PRAC, at that post reassessment committee, is that to increase the number of units and is that we have a cap. We have a cap of 6,160 houses that can be built on former Fort Ord as part of our master resolution. So the developers currently, two developments in my city, are making very large homes because of that cap to recapture their cost of the blight removal, to recapture the cost that we imposed as CFDs, et, uh, et cetera, that they, it doesn't benefit them to make 1,000 very small homes. So unless we can increase that cap, and the question is that open CEQA, is there some way around that, was the question that got posed at PRAC. Um, your idea of shifting the cost of impact fees to square footage by unit that was looked at, that's right. The fact that we can wait for fees to be paid because of the cost of money to invest, that's something that we certainly can address. But it's these unique situation that limits our growth, limits our numbers that we can build that we couldn't get around in our consideration of this kind of change looked at by the post reassessment committee. Right. So if you have answers, maybe you don't have them today, but that is something that that the city of Marina and I think every other jurisdiction here is is trying to what do we do? 
Right. And so I don't have the solution, but I have a comment on that in terms of, you know, it really seems that, that the state and jurisdictions across, you know, we're not unique. Our region is not unique in terms of this dynamic of, of wanting to do more, but how to get there. And I think that because of all this, the pent up demand that we see and truly the crisis that's before us, I think we have to look at, you know, building up, looking at the heights, looking at densities and not necessarily getting caught with, with respect to a certain number, but it's more about where we, where we develop and how we get it done versus how much, because we know we need, we know we need more. We all, I think, I, you know, I think at least the, the consensus or a strong majority can say, look, we need more and we need it sooner than later. So, so to me, um, maybe we, maybe if there's a way to find a way forward on, on that cap adjustment, but again, um, honoring the overall thrust in terms of protecting our environment, that's definitely something that, that we're, we're, we want to help with. Okay, uh, Supervisor Alejo. Thank, thank you. I wanted to um, just add and commend MBEP for, for coming to uh, these special districts and to doing the same presentation and many other local governments because uh, we all know that affordable housing is one of the most glaring issues. As you pointed out, <clears throat> I think if we needed to just address the current needs of Californians today, we needed over a million homes or a million units just to meet. And every year after that, 200,000 more. That's, that's how great the demand and that's how bad our, uh, our affordable housing crisis is uh, for California families. Uh, so it's kind of nice having an outside uh, organization come in and facilitating a, a healthy, respectful and collaborative discussion on how we could further affordable housing in the Monterey Bay area, but also um, in other parts of the state. But I, I wanted to just talk about two things. The ADU part, um, there's a lot to be learned there because as we recently found out at the county, as we're looking to update our own ordinance, state law changed that said, if you haven't updated your ADU ordinance as of January 1st, 2017, state law currently stands. Your, uh, well, we're still clarifying this legal issue, but it says your, your ordinance is null and void otherwise. Uh, so it, it, that I think was intentional so that local governments would then update it to meet the current state law. Otherwise, they can still do that, but anything before that is under current and existing state standards. Um, but what we're learning is that other counties, like our neighboring Santa Cruz County, has done a lot of things to uh, encourage ADUs. It's not the whole solution, but it's certainly part of an overall strategy. and. For example, one easy thing they did is that they, stay, they you, you create three architectural designs so the homeowners don't even have to pay for that. There's a boilerplate for um, A, B, and C. They could pick it. It's already easier to permit and streamline, and they save the architectural cost. That, for example, to me is one example that cities and the county is, is uh, the county for sure is going to be looking at and where it makes sense. There's some areas in the county where it doesn't make sense, as was pointed out earlier, for obvious reasons. So we're going to be looking at where areas that it does make sense and try to facilitate programs that where we can do more of that um, in, in our county. But back to the other part, I think any local government that's a member of FORA and FORA itself, um, there's some major things that happen finally around for affordable housing. For the first time, the state pa uh, passed 15 bills that will help streamline uh, affordable housing. It also created a new fund, SB2, which is going to generate a quarter of a million dollars, 70% coming to local governments. Um, and then also this November, of course, the affordable housing bond, $4 billion. So those local governments that are trying to come up with their short-term strategy, two, three-year plans, those that are trying to tee up projects are going to be most competitive to draw down those new dollars when they come, become available in early 2019. So I think this is the perfect time for this presentation. There's going to be more that's going to be done on housing and homelessness this legislative session, but certainly the 15 bills gives everyone in local government reason to look at this, see what you could do, tee up projects to draw down resources that are going to benefit our constituents. Thank you, Thank you Chair. Um, I do have several questions, and so I'm Pacific Grove, and we're virtually built out, and we don't have uh, city-owned land where we can um, contribute land to be developed. So I'm trying to Pacific Grove size some of the things you're talking about, um, and I and I'm not sure when you talk about bonus densities or density bonuses, does that apply to a single lot? Um, I believe it could. Okay, so it's an open question. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe no, to, to yeah, look at how this, what you're, the concepts you're you're discussing, 
could apply to there are lots of communities like Pacific Grove where we just don't have um, areas where we can do the project size that I right. think you're talking about for most. Um, um, there's at least a couple sites in PG that I'm aware of, so we well, can talk later. We have one parking lot. <laughs> we have one parking lot. There's, and there, if we wanted to um, raise City Hall, we might have some other. I land. heard the school district also has a site too. But that's not ours to control. That's the school district's. Sure. So. Um, uh, the I, I wanted to apply to the ADU issue is that when we redid our ADU and, res and created our own structure for it, um, we balanced out um, what is essentially a disincentive with reaching other goals and we required that that property cannot be eligible, either the main house or the ADU, to be a short-term rental. So it took it out of consideration. A property owner has to make a decision about whether they want to invest in an ADU given that restriction, but that was one of our, our requirements for that. And that's been deed restricted, so it carries over from owner to owner, just a thought. Um, and then my last comment is that is that when we were in, this is from Fora Information, talking about when a municipality or jurisdiction provides a benefit to a development, whether it's a waiver of fees, land, or in maybe water allocation, that project then becomes a public work. And when it becomes a public work, it is now subject to all the elements of a public work. And the first one that comes to mind is prevailing wage. That's not necessarily such a disincentive, but for a small development, the reporting, oversight, and uh, governmental obligations for abiding by that become really a disincentive for that. So is it worth doing that just because you have, so you have a waiver on your permit fees? No. Um, so I, I would, would like, if, if I'm, I'd like to know if I'm correct in that assumption. And if I'm correct in that assumption, what can we do to make sure that's not as strong a distance. So, so somebody comes to Pacific Grove, they want to develop a duplex. We tell them, yeah, this is really good density. We're going to give you a permit uh, waiver. We're going to reduce the permit fees for that. And now they're a public work. And it's just a, it's just a duplex. So what could you comment on that? <laughs> right. So at least two of our recommendations would, uh, we'd w love to apply, right? So if we, any fees that the city is assessing, right, impact fees, primarily because the planning fees, we recommend that those get paid so that your planning staff can continue working. But in terms of impact fees, if we, and we're also saying collect your impact fees, we're saying to size them based on per square footage versus per unit, so that's one. The second piece is if you're able to defer mm -hmm. the, the, con the, defer the um, uh, collection of those mm -hmm. fees to certificate of occupancy, right, when those, mm -hmm closer to the time that the impacts are actually felt by the community versus much further, you know, upstream mm -hmm. in the process. Some, some jurisdictions, uh, you know, collect that application, others that building permit phase, that can be months or years before the project actually achieves C of O. So it's not actually something you're giving them, you're just making it a benefit. Correct, you're facilitating that. Yes, right. thank you. To uh, reinforce the need uh, and the importance of this conversation, I guess I have a question for staff, and it can be answered either today or at another time. So, uh, in light of the reminder of the 160 unit limit, I sort of pulled back this question. But you know, some of us do have land and plans to develop for other purposes, but the land is currently cleared at one level of stringency, and it's not the level of stringency that would support residential development. What are, if, if if we were to change the number of units we can build on Fort Ord and make the construction of those units less expensive, what would the steps be to get the land cleared? And you can, this could be another another I, I, uh, I, meeting, you can bring that back. Yeah. That's a good half hour yeah, presentation. Right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we could provide uh, that to the board at any time. Maybe the next time we do our ESCA report, we could take a piece of it and do that that description for everyone. Okay, Mr. Hoffman, then Ms. Uh, yeah, I wanted to um, comment on 
the benefit of affordable housing for our regional transportation. So when we build exp more expensive, larger homes, more often than not, those are gonna be people moving here from other places, new people. When we build affordable workforce housing, especially the workforce housing, but affordable housing in general, what we're doing is moving people from one part of our region to another part of the region, quite likely closer to where they work. So right now we have a lot of people who live in the Valley or South County who work on the peninsula. We don't have enough housing for people on the peninsula that they can afford. But if we build more affordable housing on the peninsula, those are cars that aren't gonna be on Highway 68 that are gonna be much closer to where they work. So I just think it's important for us all to be cognizant. That is um, a, a, an important benefit. Mayor Gunther. I think something that was brought up in Matt's says, God, I don't want to listen to that guy again. Uh, you know, workforce housing, and we talk about teachers, why we're not building, I know we Pacific Grove doesn't want to build anything on their golf course or in their parking lots, but if they put teacher housing over there at some of their schools that are no longer full, all of us are guilty of not providing housing for the people that provide the service, especially for teachers, nurses, doctors, whatever we've got to do to provide that we need to do. Now, my understanding is when we talked about the amount of housing in Fort Ord, it had to do with the amount of water that was available. And that may be another discussion. How do we get more water for Fort Ord to build houses? You know, and that could be something we have to consider when we do that because they just don't have enough water to build all these. They're building the wonderful houses, but the wonderful houses for the people that work are extremely just as important. Mayor Carmel. Just going to follow up uh, on uh, with Mr. Alejo's remarks about the bills coming from Sacramento. There is a bill, uh, I believe it's SB 827, that will allow housing heights of uh, 10 stories, uh, with two stories being uh, for affordable housing, and that there is will streamline the process in uh, with the building of that if they are within half a mile to uh, transportation uh, bus or that. So just wanted to bring that up. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to comment because Mayor Gunter was correct, is was the 6,160 homes premised upon 6,600 acre feet of water? And to the same extent that you're talking about putting fees to square footage rather than units, you would allocate your water, the 6,600 feet of water, to square footage, bathroom, some other measure, not to units. Mm -hmm. the, that was one of the questions that PRAC was asking the Post Reassessment Committee was, why wouldn't we look at that? why wouldn't we go back to the Sierra Club, who's the party in this agreement that made these limitations, and if you're preserving resources, which that's what we're trying to do, you're preserving impacts on your streets to the place of public transportation, why wouldn't that be opened up? And the question is, can you make any changes there without having to do a whole new CEQA I don't know the answers, but here's some people that are dedicating resources sure. to trying to help us answer these questions. I want to use their resources to get these questions answered so we can all go forward because of the reasons for affordable housing that everybody has articulated, we all understand it. Mr. Alexander. Thank you, Matt. Um, one of the things that have been mentioned here is what are some of the concerns of the fire service? I know they, there are concerns with the, the fire service with, with spread, but there also are with density. So um, do you have any comment on that? Um, which, which means height as well. So what, what are some of their concerns? In, in I could, uh, right, that's not Fort something Ord. we looked at, but go ahead. On Fort Ord, I could answer the question. I think uh, we co-sponsored with the United States Army a regional summit on the issues about fire response, uh, particularly in the wake of what we saw in the state of California recently, 
Um, Colonel Brown uh, took the leadership position in making sure that everyone sat together. The city of Marina was also there leading the charge uh, with their fire, uh, fire captain, I think city of uh, uh, Seaside's fire captain was there, the county folks were there, the Presidio of Monterey, there was, everyone in leadership and fire all talked about this. They're concerned today about their ability to respond. Um, they're the distances between fire stations in the future as the Palm Fire Department is going to have to be winding down is of, of concern and interest. As we increase uh, the questions about in density, those are addressed within the building, within the permitting, within the state fire marshal and others that address those questions. But response times could actually be shortened if the envelope on which we build is tighter. And it seems like that's the direction we're going in if you build higher densities within a shorter framework. So it depends on if you have defensible slash defendable space, the fire folks use a little different term. But that's, that's the response we received from fire chiefs yesterday about on Fort Ord response times and issues. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and uh, open it up to the public. Public comment, please. From a uh, Fred Muir. Your presentation is extraordinarily excellent. You only need one more page, and that's how the elected officials survive politically because some of these ideas in a built out community will cause a political firestorm. <laughs> Been there and done that. But aside from that, it's, it's extraordinary and there are many things that could be implemented. But a thought, listening to the discussion around this table, if we can capture this moment in time when I haven't heard anybody talking about why we don't need more houses, even though you've had a flurry of letters recently generated by Landwatch saying we don't need the transportation infrastructure, we know there's been a lot of time spent on trying to avoid creating the additional water infrastructure, but we all agree we need the housing. So if you can stay focused on creating the workforce housing, yes, there will be environmental work that needs to be done to go beyond the current limit. But even to get to the current limit, you need to build the appropriate transportation infrastructure as a minimum but also the water infrastructure and a couple of other pieces, but it is doable. My frustration as a citizen watching is that you you seem to be at a tipping point. The last three meetings have been at a tipping point as to why we should not have the road infrastructure that was planned to allow for the 6,000 units. And the tipping point is your vote is just one or two votes and you, you stop some of that infrastructure planning. Right now, there's an effort to stop at least one water project by folks in this room and people in this room supporting that water project. We cannot build too many water projects. The threat to Marina's 1,000-foot aquifer is real. That 1,000-foot aquifer is producing water for Fort Ord and for the city of Marina. The threat to the city of Salinas to nitrates is real. We need deep water. We need the current uh, regional project, and to be truthful, we need for Marina Coast to reopen their desal efforts in their previous desal plant. So I encourage you to stay focused on building that workforce housing because it is the foundation for the future of this community. It's, it is the absolute foundation. But you can only get there if you stay focused on the other little pieces of the infrastructure and the environmental process to support it. One other thing, the meetings would get on these issues could get smaller if once you see that you're going to lose the vote, switch your vote to yes so you don't have to wait two weeks or a month to vote again. It will streamline your process a great deal. Uh, Tom Mancini. Uh, I was reading this uh, on page uh, 43. I think you need to make some corrections. It is not community human services, it's community housing services. Uh, it's the form of Shelter Outreach Plus. I do not believe the Monterey County Housing Authority got those buildings. I think those buildings went to see Sun, uh, Sun Street Centers. Uh, the count on uh, Appendix 1, a little bit off. Interim, a lot of the buildings are transferred, the majority of buildings that were transferred are either duplex 
with duplex, triplex, or fourplexes. Uh, an example of uh, that would be the uh, Veterans Transition Center. We've got 20 buildings. We've got 10 duplexes. You have it down for uh, 13. A fourplex is, uh, was built. Four duplexes were modernized by the city of Marina. So their count really is, your count on headcount, your headcount on housing units needs to be looked at. Um, as an example, uh, I'm trying to, I'm, I know that uh, Shelter Outreach Plus, which is basically now the new community human services, the majority of them are duplexes. And I think their count's about 58. I think Interim's got about 58. So if somebody needs to do an account the type of buildings that they are. Uh, as far as water goes, I think you, if you take another analysis of how you determine how much water gets used, stop charging people for fixtures. Start charging units on the number of people that live in the house. Yeah, I, I, Seaside went through this many, many years ago. Uh, with the, we, we, we had a lawsuit against uh, the water district and uh, we will, if you charge, if you give a count, if you, if you allocate a, 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 number, a number of acre feet to a fixture, the fixture doesn't any generate water. The people that turn the fixture on generate the water. In my house, because of the new system that Seaside's put in, my wife and I only use 30 gallons a day. When my kids when my kids drop in, it probably goes up to forty or fifty gallons a day. But that's three that's thirty gallons a day. That's three hundred gallons a month, which is just under uh, what uh, half an acre, half a half a half a unit. My water bill is only thirty five dollars in Seaside. That's because we have a, a very efficient Seaside Water Company. But somebody needs to sit down and take a look at all of these figures as to the exact number of units. Mm -hmm. Uh, out there, and nobody mentioned the fact that Seaside has a project on the board. Mr. Glover wants to modernize those two nurses' housings up on the, up behind the uh, the nurses' bed. the nurses' quarters behind the hospital. Thank you. Three minutes to put them into workforce housing. <clears throat> Ron Cheshire, I was having a good Friday the thirteenth. I've been involved with the Fort Ord base closure since 1990. I think Tom and I are probably the seniors in the room, along with Mr. Muir. And uh, the original hopes for the community were that uh, in Seaside and Marina, which had very affordable housing at the time, and lots of it, at maybe $100 a square foot in 1990, 1991, which was very affordable for the workers in the area. Now you have houses in Marina that are 1,200 square foot. Tom and I wouldn't be able to play checkers in the living room and they cost $550,000. The market has changed, and it's changed for a number of reasons. It's changed because of politics, mostly, and demand. I hope we're not trying to change what this community had hoped for at one time. Fort Ord cannot be the bastion of affordable housing. Other communities need to step up to the plate and provide their fair share. This is a multi-faceted problem. You know, if you had good paying careers in this area, people could buy the market rate housing that's here. But yet, economic development has not been addressed to the point that we hoped it would have been. We've taken care of some of the other situations, and I think that Mr. Muir outlined it in his paper that he passed out. This is 
the environment and education are well on their way. Economic development is not. And if you want to know how to report on prevailing wages without it costing an arm and a leg and giving you a lot of consternation, I'll come over and show you in PG. Sure. Thank you. Good afternoon. Name is Eric Peterson, and relevant to this, I live in Salinas. Uh, Matt, very interesting presentation. A lot of interesting stuff in there. But I'd like to seize on one comment you made, and that was uh, the concept of reducing parking. I live in a very nice street with single family residences. My next door neighbor has four cars. So Sometimes I get there and I get to park in front of my home. Usually I get there and they're parked in front of my home. No big deal. I blocked the driveway. But you take it further. When they're parking in front of their home, or I'm parking in front of their home, it's illegal. There's a fire hydrant there. You go down to the end of the street, there's well, probably about a third of the time there's a handicap ramp blocked by a parked car. You go the other way, you've got a really nice park which has no parking, 10 p.m. To, to 6 a.m. So you see, you see where I'm going with this. We've got a problem, and this is single family residence. Next street over has the same problem. Next street over is Cherokee Drive, which is a parking nightmare. Um, you get into places with apartments, and it can get even worse. A few years ago, when Janet Barnes represented District 3 on Salina City Council, there was a fire on Catherine Avenue, which is mostly single family residence with some relatively small apartment buildings. Fire department shows up to put out the fire. Problem, they can't get to the fire hydrant. A car is parked there. So they run the hoses through the car, which was kind of neat. Six houses were burned because of the lack of access to the fire hydrant. People in that street have a problem. They go down to the end, turn right, they can't park because it's permit parking. They go down the street to the and turn left, uh, they can't park during the day because it's two hour parking. You see, and this is all over Salinas. You know that as well as I do. And um, getting back to Catherine Avenue, I know somebody used to have a business at, down at that intersection. Why did he move his business? got tired of his customers getting parking tickets. They were parking in the permit parking area. Uh, parking in enforcement in Salinas is amazingly inconsistent. Um, I would urge you to give problems like this uh, some consideration. And we're Californians. Californians are really wedded to the car. And uh, it's not so much a means of transportation, it's a means of expressing your personality and more. And uh, we need to change that, but we're not going to change it quickly. And so I would urge you to uh, not uh, limit uh, or restrict anything on parking. It's just going to make streets like mine more exciting. Thank, Thank you. you. I can't. I can't go after him for like the next five minutes, right? No, okay, just, I'm just kidding. Is he talking I'll about me? I'll see you me? back in Salinas. <laughs> okay. All right. Reclaiming my time. Ian Oglesby, uh, Seaside. You guys have a couple different issues here, and the thing is, I'm agreeing with Mr. Mueller. I want to make sure you you spoke truth to power, even though you're a very powerful man. <laughs> right? You guys need to listen to what he said. My, but my point is, there's some things in there that are for cities. Then there's things in there what four can do. So you guys have to do what you need to do for your city, and I appreciate uh, Councilwoman Gail Norton about saying how you want to work with them because it's a city issue and it could be a four concern also. Uh, someone talked about how to make sure these things don't turn into uh, short-term rentals and vice versa. I'm on the city planning commission. We just talked about short-term rentals. We made sure short-term rentals don't turn into ADUs. So it's the same thing. If you have ADUs, you just make sure you put it in there. So it can be done. We just handled it uh, Thursday night. Uh, my concept is I, I would have hoped that four would do something as a group. And someone mentioned uh, working together on some architectural designs. Those same things can be shared with uh, other communities. Uh, four could lessen the impact with the cities 
when they come together, same thing you guys did similar to um, the uh, urban, urban guidelines, right? So it's not every home, you know, we want. You just maybe want one on each community, one block, face block, or a couple throughout. But if we were able to do, I don't know, 150, 200 on the fourth, that's an impact, right? And then if each city, I agree with Ron, everybody needs to do their part, even the Carmel and, and the county, you know, if you just took another 250, 300 of these within the county, that takes some pressure off. And that's what people need. That's what affordable housing is for. Uh, yes, it may not meet workforce housing. Maybe that, that young teacher or doctor don't want to live in the ADU, but the ADU takes the pressure off of the apartment, which takes <laughs> the, per, the, the pressure off of that, that, uh, co that, that uh, what is it, couple, the young couple, that's what I'm trying to say. Each one makes a difference. So if we just added three or 400, 500 of those in the county, uh, that makes a difference. And they keep going around and around. As people grow, as they age out, they don't want to be in the ADU. Well, that opens it up for a young person, high school, college, high school, college, Right, we don't want them to move out that fast, right? Mm -hmm. College, but young couples that only want that space. And my understanding is they could be up to uh, 1,200 square foot, so that could be an older couple that want to size down. You know, they have the space in their backyard. They can put a little 900 square foot in the backyard and turn over the 1,700 to an up and coming couple. So it's there. Uh, four could uh, lead the way with some of the discussion. That's what I would ask for us to do. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there any more public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, any further comments or questions? Chair, well, thank, I, chair thank you, could, Matt, for chair, a could, very just great say, uh, presentation. It's only an information item, but uh, if the board uh, wishes to direct staff to continue working with the Monterey Bay Economic Partnership on this idea and the individual jurisdictions and the educational partners, Maybe in 90 or 120 days we come back with an additional response or something that would be along those lines if that's sort of the direction the board staff can accept that. Sure, make it so, number one. <laughs> so, so to follow up to that, are we able to commit their resources? That's that's the question. And I, I just wanted to go to the issue of the jurisdiction's requirements. And you had a slide up there. The city of Marina from AMBAG's allocation last time go around was we got that we are to build, provide for, plan for 1,300 affordable housing units. And I think AMBAG assigned that to us thinking the city of Marina has this tremendous amount of land out here on Fort Ord. And when we worked on our housing element, that was like, oh, but they didn't understand there's only 6,160 units. And we already had entitled roughly 2,400 and the other jurisdictions want some too. So it's really important that all of us are discussing and looking at because each agency goes through its own thinking but doesn't think about these other limitations. And so thank you for your work, thank you for your contribution and if our director is able to commit you to work with him or our staff or our directors have had, please come. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th thank you for your concern. Uh, we have um, a limited amount of bandwidth, but it turns out that this question about affordable housing has come up in our economic development work that we're doing. It comes up in our coordination work with the individual ju the jurisdictions because there's a requirement to meet certain items and they ask what does it mean to do a jobs housing balance. Our educational partners at MPC, MPUSD, and CSUMB have all been partners to some of these items. And our colleagues at UCSC have even understood that maybe some of their ancillary parcels that were part of the work that was done a few years ago might be available for you know some use, provided there's water and something else to do. But yes, it's part of what we already do. It will require some additional bandwidth that we don't really have, but it's got to be done. And I just wanted to say that we would be happy to work with your staff, Michael, as, uh, as I said in, the, in my opening comments, as a valued member, we definitely prioritize the work we do with our members because those are the ones that actually pay for the resources that we're able to, to do. Um, so I encourage anybody that's in the room that's not a member to become a member. Um, that's not to say we're not going to work with people that aren't members, but we really try to be wise in how we spend our resources. And the additional monies that I mentioned that we're coming into next month 
they, we do have some uh, ideas earmarked for that, specifically around water and housing. So um, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the next item, which is public comment period. Is there any public comment on items not on the agenda? Okay, any items from members? All right, then we stand adjourned. Thank you. Yeah.